Good evening gamers. Today, I think I want to give something a little bit of a crack. Uh, it's not going to be all too high effort, but I'm going to be ranking every single character in Overwatch as of Season 6 based on how difficult I think they are to play. And the reason why I want to do this, besides just it's fun, is because as someone who plays a good amount of basically every character in the game with only like four or five characters I don't have a lot of playtime in and I don't think I can play to a like good standard and of those four or five characters all four or five of them are DPS characters um, which is the role I do play the least of but even then I still have played a good amount of it best way to put it is uh i i this is i'm actually calculated it but like my playtime is like split like 41 percent support 39 percent you know tank 20 percent dps if he wants me to give an estimation of the split so there you go uh but as someone who has given basically every character in this game a pretty good shot and as someone who very much goes by the philosophy of literally no matter how honest your character is someone is going to find you annoying and so, I'm pretty permissive when it comes to characters that some people might say are, Oh, they're demonic, or I hate those characters. How can people who play those characters live with themselves? You know, um, I don't feel that way about many characters in this game, but I don't feel that way about no characters either. We'll get there when we get there. Uh, either way, uh, Thingy, I feel like I can give a pretty fair answer to like a lot of these because I feel like I am going to have at least a somewhat informed opinion on basically all of these. There's going to be one or two heroes where I've got blind spots because I just don't play them that much. Uh, but that being said, um, let's kick this off. There's only one more thing I want to say before we really start and that is I can't believe I actually could not find a pre-made tier list template with a Lari already on it except the fucking smash or pass one. <laughs> but either way, I edited it, so yeah, there we go, we got all the heroes now. So let's, I love how we get to start with Anna as well, considering Anna is my most played hero, uh, but of course it goes alphabetically, so I guess it makes sense. Now, where would I put Anna? Is she gigabrain? Is she demanding? Is she tough? Is she average? Is she relaxed? Is she sort of easy? Or is she brain dead? I might change my mind, I'll see if I do, but I think I'm going to put Anna on the high end of demanding. It's a pretty popular opinion that Anna is a very difficult support to play, uh, but also I don't hear many people claiming she's one of the most difficult characters in the game, and I think I have to agree with that. Ultimately, I think the main thing that prevents Anna from entering into the category of Giga Brain is that she has no mobility, and while you don't need mobility to be difficult, mobility is the like easiest way to introduce a whole lot of depth extremely quickly into a character's kit because there's just so many different places you can position yourself and having more movement allows there to be more possible answers to different situations given different positioning. Uh, when you have a character with no mobility, it's difficult to make them take a lot of skill. However, Anna does have extremely high skill mechanics on everything but her mobility. Of course, she has a hit scan weapon, which while it can't headshot, it's still very important to connect your shots with it, and you need to use that both to damage and heal. As well as that, she and Baptiste are the only two healers in the game whose healing isn't some kind of auto aim mechanic or something that's basically automatic. I guess you could say Alari too, but considering how close you have to be to even use Alari's heal beam, I hesitate to count that. At that point, it's kind of hard to miss. Bio Grenade, of course, is one of my favorite abilities in any shooter game like this. I love how it's got two different use cases, depending on whether you use it on enemies or allies, with it either boosting healing for your allies or dealing damage and negating healing for your enemies. And I love how it means that for brief moments, Anna can play like a tank by using the fact that they're denying healing to deny space from the opponents and allow your tank to take it from them. Since, in a weird way, space being held is very dependent on being able to be healed, so being able to disable healing kind of completely shifts the concept of what space is even anymore for a brief moment until the anti-heal wears off. And so it can cause a lot of people who are in an area which would otherwise be considered their space to suddenly be out of position and die just because you landed one good anti-nade. 
And lastly, the Sleep Dart, one of the most difficult projectiles to land in the game, not only because it's small and travels slowly, but also because it's delayed and telegraphed with a very distinct sound effect and animation, on a long cooldown no less as well. When you also take into account the fact that Anna has no mobility does in fairness also mean that she has to position more smartly, because while other supports like Mercy or Lucio might be able to get away with some momentary bad positioning by quickly getting out of there, Anna can't, that does mean you have to think quite a lot about where you want to set up shop and start, you know, scoping in and going for long range shots, because you've got to make sure that nothing nasty is going to surprise you from a certain direction, but you also still need to have line of sight of your tank. So yeah, overall I definitely agree that Anna is a difficult support, and I definitely think she's one of the most well designed characters this game has ever seen. That being said, I don't think I can put her in the Gigabrain category. Again, no disrespect to Anna players, I'm one of you. <laughs> She's still very high on the list, but overall, I just don't think she has that X factor. That kind of thing which really makes it so you have to spend years mastering this character. Ash. I think it'd be fair to say that Ash is... Ooh, actually, do I want to go tough or average? You see, I want to say tough, because I'm like, well, she takes aim, obviously. And, um, you know, you get there's some interesting strategic stuff in how you use Bob. But in fairness, there are a lot of characters that require aim. And while not always, in most situations, having a hit scan, it's, it makes aiming easier. And there aren't that many unique gimmicks to how Ash plays that you have to deal with that make aiming more difficult. So I am kind of teetering back and forth on whether I want to say she's tough or average. I think I'll say low end of tough. I'll be fair to Ash players, I think that the reason that I want to say average is because you can easily just keep getting body shots with Ash and keep getting poke damage and still do quite well. But in fairness, I suppose you'll rarely carry with Ash if all you're doing is really poking and then trusting your teammates to sweep up the enemies or trusting the enemy supports to not heal quickly enough to counteract your poke. You know, you've actually got to be landing consistent headshots to burst people down before they can be healed and that is obviously tough. Uh, so, I think it's fair to say that Ash is tough. Baptiste. Okay, to be fair, I probably shouldn't have called the top tier Giga Brain because um, Baptiste is not Giga Brain for big brain reasons necessarily, but I'm actually going to put him here. And I can only believe I'm doing this. My past self would hate me for doing this because I used to hate Baptiste. I used to, well, to be honest, I still, there are aspects of, of Baptiste I still don't like, but I obviously have played him a lot more since. And. I guess I just don't like the idea of having more supports in the game that are just damage and healing, and Baptiste to me is like the face of that. I feel like there are so many bad decisions without Baptiste, and he kind of to me is a marker representative of where a lot of things started to go sour with Overwatch. But that being said, as a character, I can't deny he is very, very high skill. A big reason why I put him so high isn't necessarily for the brain side of things, I guess, although I do think there's some strategy to playing Bap, obviously. It's actually more for the aim. You might be like, well, sure, you've got to aim with Baptiste and that's difficult, but why would that put him at the top tier? There's plenty of characters you've got to aim with. Here's the thing. I actually think that it's understated how difficult it is being good with your aim with Baptiste. I think that Baptiste is the single most difficult character in the entire game to have good, consistent aim with. Now, let me explain that. If you're playing your typical main DPS, if you're playing someone like Cass, Soldier, Ash, Widow, Hanzo, any of these kind of characters, you are either using a hitscan weapon or a projectile weapon. You deal with recoil or you don't. And you deal with travel time or you don't. While each character has unique properties of their weapon that you have to get used to and adapt to to be able to use them effectively, at the end of the day, they only have one thing they need to learn, they just need to learn it very well. Bap's primary and secondary fire, his triple burst rifle and his healing grenades, both test completely different kinds of aim skill, and both do it in extremely difficult and skill challenging ways. Obviously his triple burst rifle is a hit scan. However, unlike Cass, it's a hit scan which being a triple burst with recoil means you have to learn to fight against the recoil to be able to aim straight while firing. Sure, Cass also has recoil, but considering how much time you get to reorient your shot as the gun is like coming back into position, it's not that difficult to compensate for it on Cass. Whereas on BAP, when you first click, you fire three bullets whether you want to or not, so you instantly have to control for recoil while you're firing the three round burst. 
and it's extremely difficult to keep firing accurately on a target, especially while you're jumping through the air, which you wouldn't be doing on Cass as well, probably while fighting is that, you know, you're going to be using your exo boots to jump all around. It's going to get really tough actually staying accurate on your target, and if you don't land headshots, you don't do good damage, so you've got to keep doing headshots too. But then, on top of that, you can't even leave it at that, because you also got to heal. However, the healing that you shoot is a projectile, not a hit scan. And as well as that, it's a projectile with a downward arc you have to compensate for. Now, if it was just these two things already, I think that would make BAP really challenging, but I would still only put them in demanding. Here's the reason why I'm putting BAP in Giga Brain. I am going to give a bit of favorability to skill ceiling over skill floor here. Because I feel like that's just the most fair way to do this. I think that while I will still take it into account if a character has a really low skill floor, if you, it's really easy to do the bare minimum on a character, that will drag them down a bit. At the same time, I am going to judge them more based on how far you can push them if you are good with them. And if you're a good BAP and you can actually swap between landing consistent headshots with a triple burst hitscan rifle, which you have to control the recoil for while jumping through midair, and then also in between every single triple burst shot, you instantly switch your brain to projectile mode and then start landing long range healing projectiles with travel time and arcs to compensate for and also start direct hitting on those. Yeah, if you can actually switch your brain between both of those modes rapidly and consistently go shoot, heal, shoot, heal, shoot, heal on different targets at multiple different intervals as BAP while flying through the sky, at that point, I think you're basically hitting the apex of what you can do with aim in Overwatch. I think a Baptiste who can actually pull that off is demonstrating more aim skill than even your most cracked widow. Because while I'm not saying that a cracked widow isn't extremely skillful, she obviously is, they have only expressed mastery of one thing. That being a hit scan weapon which always shoots where you point it, with no recoil, no arc to compensate for, no spread, nothing like that. Just you click and it shoots where you click. Whereas Bat would have to develop a mastery of basically every single kind of issue you can run into while aiming that can make aiming more accurately more difficult. So hopefully I've made my case. As much as I kind of don't like to admit it, I do think it's fair to say that Bap is the single most aim-challenging character in the game, and so he deserves to be at the top tier. Bastion. Uh, how far do I want to go with this one? I think I have to be real myself. Sort of easy. Um, I was thinking about putting him in relaxed, because you can do some big brain plays with Bastion every now and then. You can grenade jump off some really interesting geometry and do some pretty cool rollouts with him if you know what you're doing. And certainly with his insane damage output, he's an extremely effective character for going for extremely unexpected assassinations from the back if you find extremely creative ways to maneuver around the enemy defenses or somehow end up behind them when they don't expect it. That being said, obviously, if we're talking your normal game with Bastion, he's more on the brain-dead side of things if we're talking your average Bastion. You do just kind of fire generally at the biggest, fattest targets you can, occasionally shoot a grenade out there, and then use turret form to melt the tank when they don't have any way to stop you from doing that. I don't think I have to spend too long on Bastion, because I don't think this is that controversial a take, and frankly, I don't think there's a lot to say about Bastion. That being said, Brig. Now, I know there's a lot of people who want me to put Brig here, but you fool. I secondary Brig when it comes to supports, so I'm going to make an argument for her. Brig is relaxed. Listen, I get it. Brig does not take a whole bunch of aim. The only thing that takes aim is Whipshot, which is a slow projectile, which does mean you have to predict movements pretty heavily. But also, it's got a relatively large hitbox, so, you know, it kind of, you know, balances out. Certainly, it's not a character that takes a whole lot of mechanical skill. I'm not going to argue that. But I love Brig because, again, I've mentioned this before, but I play this game more to think than to aim. And so I kind of like Brig because, well, it kind of feels more like a strategy game with Brig. Where, you know, you win or you lose a lot of the time based on how effective your decision making is rather than how effective your aim is. And I know that there's a lot of people who'll be like, but it's brainless playing Brig. You just sit there at the back throwing heal packs every now and then and occasionally pressing the, the button to use whip shot and then just standing there healing everyone with Inspire. And then when you, whenever you're actually about to die, you just press rally and bash the person killing you and then you win. And don't get me wrong. That's certainly a part of Brig. There's certainly a lot of games on Brig when they go ideally that work like that. But I know for a fact, if you think that is every game on Brig, that you have never actually truly played Brig. 
I know for a fact that most of the people who will flame me and say that I am brainless and that I take no skill playing Brig, if they actually sat down and played Brig, would feed their brains out. You see, I'm sure most of you already know by now, but for anyone not aware, Brig is not a mini Reinhardt. That's what a lot of people think, and unfortunately it's not even necessarily their fault. The game really does make it seem like she's supposed to be a mini Reinhardt, but she really is not. Funnily enough, she's almost the complete opposite. Brig is not supposed to be someone who fights alongside you on the front line, although she can be for brief moments every now and then. Brig is supposed to be someone who sits relatively far back and acts as a personal bodyguard for your other support. All you have to do as Brig to be effective is keep a relatively high inspire up time and not die. Obviously you can go for kills on Brig, but generally if going for kills will even slightly jeopardize your chances of staying alive or protecting your other support, it is not the smart thing to do. Generally on Brig, you simply sit in the back, occasionally use whipshot, and you wait for things to happen rather than going out there and causing things to happen so much. So yeah, don't get me wrong, if you've got a team that's all working in perfect harmony like clockwork and it's all theoretically going perfect, yeah, you really do just sit in the back and occasionally press whipshot and that works. But again, that never really happens. There's always someone on your team who's feeding. There's always a tank who just doesn't pay attention to something happening behind them and now you've got to go deal with it. Something will always go wrong. And the second something goes wrong, playing Brig becomes a whole lot more dynamic and you have to very quickly make snap decisions on whether you want to go in or you want to go out. Because that's another thing I really like about Brig, although I could see why a lot of other people might not like this because it is frustrating when you make the wrong decision. That being the... As Brig, you can only get kills on people who are practically in your face, but as I just mentioned, the ideal way to play her is far in the back, bodyguarding your other support. So I guess in a way almost similar to D.Va, you have this constant dilemma where you have no idea if you need to be at the front or the back. If you're at the front, you can actually get some kills and actually maybe deal with some of these enemies. They can't escape you unless they got speed or something like that. But at the same time, you don't kill very fast on Brig, and so you need to be able to continuously chase someone and know you'll get the punish on them before they can get to their supports if that's the case. And as well as that, you're putting your life in danger when, as Brig, you are probably the number one person in the game who should not be dying if it can be helped. So, it does mean that you have to make extremely difficult decisions on snap moments with Brig about whether, when something goes wrong, is your response to go in and kill the people who cause the problem, or is your response to run away. And if you make the wrong decision, you can't change your mind, because by the time you started going one direction, you don't have enough time to start running the other direction. So yeah, I do think that Brig is generally an easy character, I'm not going to go against that. She basically takes next to no mechanical skill, and I'm well aware of that. That's practically why I like her. And of course, I'm not putting her on the upper end of this list. I'm putting her in relaxed because I acknowledge that. But I am putting her only slightly on the lower end of the list because I feel like I've made a pretty solid argument for how you do actually have to think a decent amount when you play Brig more than a lot of people give her credit for. Though certainly that doesn't necessarily mean she's suddenly the most big brain character in the game. Just because she's all brain and no aim doesn't mean that she's more brain than every other character in the game. There are other characters which, while they do also take aim, still take more brain brain than Brig. I just think that it's only a few characters when some people might argue it's almost every character. Cass. Oh, this is an interesting one. It is very aim dependent, but it's also very basic. And the fact that you have magnetic grenade reduces the dependence on aim. Hmm. I think I'm going to put Cass in relax as well, because I I kind of feel like, feel like I play Cass in similar situations to Brig, but for DPS. Where I feel like, I feel like when I play Cass, it's kind of like, I just want to relax this game and just, whatever happens, I'll help. Like, I'm not gonna not help or anything, it's not like I'm not trying, but like, I'm not gonna sweat to try and turn this around. I'm just gonna play this game out and try and enjoy it. I feel like that's usually my mindset when I play Cass, and that's obviously a very similar mindset I have when I pick Brig. So, yeah, I think I'm happy with that placement. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing really that crazy about Cass except simple, ha simply, like, having aim. So, yeah, there's not that much to talk about. I think it's fair to put him here. Doomfist. I hope no one is going to find this shocking. I'm pretty sure everyone should understand this. Doomfist is Giga Brain. Um, I don't... Do I even have to bother explaining why? Um, 
I think that Wrecking Ball is the only character in the game who even competes with Doomfist for the amount of movement tech he has. And even then, I think Doomfist has more. Not sure. Might be wrong. Um, so Doomfist is probably the single ha highest, like, is the character with the single highest requirement for movement skill. Because you have to abuse a multiple mul multitude of take... Let me try that again. A multitude of movement techs to actually push his momentum and his movement to the fullest extent. But on top of that, you have to play what is probably the single most difficult archetype of tank in the game. Or just general, like, hero in the game. That being the dive characters. You constantly have to jump into enemy space, figure out an escape route while still fighting the enemies, judge the exact moment at which you should be making your escape, make your escape, which requires you to execute multiple movement techs sometimes, and then on top of that, make sure that you've taken space from that interaction, or if you haven't, figure out what went wrong and why you didn't take space and what you can do to change that. All while having to balance this with, you know, not feeding and just giving the enemies free ultimate charge. Playing a dive tank, it's literally always an uphill fight, and the only thing you have to get the advantage is your superior mobility, which practically is another way of saying all you have is your pure mechanical skill and big brain skills. <laughs> It's probably not that controversial to say that mobility, as I mentioned, practically directly correlates with skill, and so high mobility characters are generally going to be a lot of the top ranked characters here. Me personally, I can play Doomfist okay. I can select Doomfist and I can win a decent amount of games. My win rate with him is positive. But I can't pretend like he's a natural fit for me. I feel like I'm good with his archetype of playstyle, but he is simply so difficult and intricate that even though I feel like I have a natural affinity for this kind of playstyle, it still doesn't quite click with me. I have many games on Doomfist where it feels like I'm rolling and I get to have a big ego moment, but then every now and then I still get into games with Doomfist where it just feels hopeless. And I look at the scoreboard and I'm like, well, I can't blame anyone but myself. Clearly, I'm the one who's dropping the ball here, but I don't know what I'm doing wrong and I don't even know how I'm supposed to improve. This feels impossible. So while I still feel like I can... Hold my own on Doomfist, I've got to say. I've tried, I have tried to, you know, become a Doomfist main, and it just, I can't do it, man. It's too much. <laughs> so yeah, respect to all you Doom players out there. Just as long as you don't ego in the chat and start shit-talking everyone. <laughs> oh god, Diva. Oh, where do I rank Diva? Diva's really, really tough to rank. Because here's the thing. There are two kinds of Diva. There's the D.Va that just feeds, that just flies directly into the entire enemy team, holds down shoot, never, like, lets go of shoot, and then just suddenly uses all of their defense matrix the second they're about to actually die, and just prays their supports bail them out. And if they don't, they get demeched and run away and get their mech back. And they think that they're playing the character correctly. And those kind of D.Va's, obviously, I would say, I would honestly go as far as to say, here. I would say that, like, you know, that kind of D.Va here. And unfortunately, that is a lot of divas. I'm glad to say that ever since Overwatch 2, I haven't seen as many divas being like that, but I noticed in Overwatch 1, towards the end of the game's life. I never noticed it for the first couple months that I came back to play on PC, but after a couple months, I started noticing every single game we had a diva, the diva was always the worst player on our team. Uh, again, now in Overwatch 2, that they have to be the one to make space, and they no longer can be the off tank, they have to be the main tank. I have seen that a lot of divas have had to put up or shut up, and it seems like natural selection has kicked in, and only the good divas have stuck around for the most part. So I definitely see a lot less bad divas anymore, but on top of that, I also see a whole lot less of diva in general as a result. So yeah, bad divas are here, but the reason this is tough is that I think good divas are all the way up here. Because here's the thing, kind of similar to what I said before with Brig, D.Va has this inherent contradiction, where you're playing a character that, like most tanks, can only do good damage up close, and she does good damage up close. But the thing is, she needs to be in the back to peel for her supports and use defense matrix to save them. You can't do both of these things, 
And realistically, you have to lean towards the being on the front line thing. It's kind of the opposite of Brig, where you can't do both, but most of the time you're staying in the back. With Deverance, you can't do both, but most of the time you're staying on the front. Because while you can just babysit your supports and be ready to defense matrix them at any time to keep them alive, that means you're not going to actually hold the front line and you're basically leaving your DPS for dead. I think as I'm talking about this, I've convinced myself to say that I should judge Diva by the good Divas, not the bad ones. So I think I will lock her in in that spot. I never really considered whether D.Va was a difficult character or not uh, in the past, and then when I came back to Overwatch on PC, I remember that one of my first games back, I had an experience, which is kind of the first moment where I realized this character is a lot more high skill than people give them credit for, if you actually know what you're doing on them. And that was a game on Hanamura, where I remember that we were trying to hold the gate, as always, on first point, and there was a Roadhog on the enemy team, and this was back when he could one-shot, and I was playing Anna, and while everyone was caught up in this massive team fight, and I was watching it from a distance, standing on the high ground, trying to heal people, suddenly a bunch of people got out of the way, and the hog managed to get a clear shot on me and hooked me off high ground. And I thought for sure I was dead. I thought for absolutely certain I was dead. Because our main tank was dead, our other support was coming back from spawn, and as well as that, the D.Va, the only other tank left to protect me, was the furthest forward person who couldn't even see what was happening behind them. And yet the second that D.Va heard the sound cue for the hook going off, she instantly used boosters, 180 turned away from the person she was about to kill, put up defense matrix and saved my life even though they literally only heard the hook sound effect from behind them while they were already engaged in fighting both the enemy supports at once. And that just blew my mind because I'm like... You literally just heard the chain. You didn't even know if it got anyone. You didn't even know where exactly the hog was. You just knew there was somewhere behind you. And yet they instantly 180'd and defense matrix and saved my life. And I was just like, holy shit. I guess that's what a good diva is. You need amazing awareness. And you need to know on a snap decision with absolutely no time to stop and think whether you want to keep pursuing targets to go for kills or whether you want to peel for your backline and save them. So hopefully that'll make you understand if you're someone who thinks that D.Va's a bit on the lower end of the spectrum why I feel I want to put D.Va at the top because I, as I said, I wanted, I decided I want to judge them off of the better D.Va's for the most part and I do think the better D.Va's are way more high skill than people give them credit for. Divas who are actually good are some of the people in the game with the best awareness and positioning and some of the best snap decision making that I can see from most of the tanks in the game. So yeah. Echo. Oh boy, I'm gonna... I just realized this one's gonna be really spicy, isn't it? Okay, you're gonna pretty quickly clock on that I don't like flying characters. I mean... Quite simply, the fact that they can sit camp in the sky and shoot at you from the sky means that you have to use a hit scan to kill them. Here's the problem with that. Tanks, aside from Wrecking Ball, which even then not ideal, don't have any hit scans that can shoot straight. And so that means that if you are a tank, you literally can't do anything against a flying character. The best you can do is go D.Va and chase them midair, but even then you can only chase them for brief couple second long intervals on a four second cooldown. And if they've got a mercy pocket, good fucking luck. <laughs> So tanks basically can't do anything. Supports can do something. You can go Alari or Baptiste, and or, or sometimes even Anna. And uh, if you've got good aim, you can skill diff the people in the sky and maybe win. But even then, again, if they got Mercy Pocket, it's pretty hopeless for the supports unless they get some help from other people. And if it just so happens the two DPS players on your team either don't play hit scan or don't want to play hit scan, no matter how much they should play hit scan, then guess you just fucking lose, regardless of how much of a skill difference there is between you. And the enemy team, in general, if the enemy team decides they want to play Pharmacy or, Far or Mercy Echo, and your team decides, and your team's two DPS players decide, no, we're not playing Hitscan into that, then you just roll over and die. Have fun. And you know what? I don't think that's super healthy for the game. Especially because, as I mentioned, I play this game more to think than to aim, even though I do still play aim-intensive characters. And so I don't really like a character who just says, fuck all your rules, if you can't land this shot with a hitscan character, then you don't get to play the video game. And it's like... Oh, okay, well, that's the part of the game I like, but never mind. Either way, yeah, I'm not a fan of flying characters, and I know that Echo is generally considered a very high-skill character. 
but I'm not going to lie. I've played a decent amount of Echo, and she's one of my highest win rate DPSs. And I'm not going to lie, I do not pick her and sweat on her. I don't think a whole lot about playing her. I pick her, I bully the tank from the sky where they can't shoot me all game to farm ult charge, and then I duplicate, and then usually that leads to some kind of team fight win, because duplicate's a very powerful ultimate. And, you know, usually, you know, spamming the tank is not considered to be a very... Oh, you know, I'm even putting it below break. Um, usually spamming the tank is not considered to actually be the good strategy as a DPS. You know, it's what a lot of not very confident players do, but it's not actually the best strategy most of the time, because obviously you get more value trying to go for picks on lower health targets, even if they're harder to shoot. But in the case of Echo, I actually think the best strat is to farm ult charge off the tank. Because with other DPSs, your ults are some of the weakest ults in the game compared to tank ults and support ults. But for Echo, you have one of the strongest ultimates in the entire entire game on a flying character a character that the tank can't do shit about so if you just fly above the tank's head somewhere where they literally cannot fight back against you and you simply pelt them with bombs laser beams and your primary fire eventually they're gonna die and no nothing can really save them from that their supports can't do anything they can't do anything their dps has to actually notice that you're doing that and stop you but i'll let you in on a little secret a lot of DPS players get tunnel visioned and don't pay attention to their tank getting bullied all game by the Echo that they should be killing. And if that ends up being the case, then, well, you just get to bully their tank all game. They never get to make any space and you get free ult charge constantly. And any time that this actually backfires, you can just use duplicate for a free team fight win. So I'm not going to lie, while I realize if you're actually doing high level play with Echo... You know, you could say, oh, but it's difficult to land these projectile shots from a long distance. Oh, but using duplicate optimally, you have to know how to play every hero. I'm not going to lie. It really feels to me like the best way to play Echo is just to bully the tank. Because, I mean, even if one of the DPS realizes what's happening and they actually start to come after you. One, they would need to be a hit scan. Two, even if they are a hit scan, if you just then decide, okay, I'm just going to de dedicate some time to making this one DPS cry then. I'm just going to start hiding from them and then dropping down on top of them and assassinating them out of nowhere with just jumping on them with sticky bombs and focusing beam before they could even fight back. And if you do that enough, eventually they start running away from you instead of trying to fight you and then you go back to bullying the tank. So, yeah. I don't know, maybe I'm be- I Okay, I'm going to leave the door open here. If you are an Echo Connoisseur and you have a good argument, I'll hear you out in the comments. Because I'm going to acknowledge here that I'm being a little bit less charitable with this one, I realize. Because earlier, I was saying, for the most part, if I'm going to judge them based off the high skill stuff. And what I'm saying is, like, a low skill Echo, technically, this playstyle. I just genuinely think this playstyle is most effective. <laughs> it shouldn't be, but it is. And as for the whole, you have to know how to play any, any everyone to be able to play Echo because you have Duplicate, I'm not going to lie, I kind of call bullshit on that, because I feel like there's a preset pool of a few characters that you really want to duplicate, and you don't usually divert from that pool. There's obviously Duplicate the Tank is like the most obvious one, but then there were the nerfs to that, which, don't get me wrong, Duplicate the Tank is still like a safe bet most of the time, if you have no idea who a good target to Duplicate is. But even then, I feel like Usually it comes down to I duplicate a support if they have a good ultimate, which most supports do. Uh, if it's a DPS, I duplicate Ash or May, but for most of the DPSs, I don't bother duplicating unless they're really good in that specific situation. And if none of those conditions are met, then I duplicate the tank. That's basically the logic tree that goes through my head, and it means that I don't end up playing a wide variety of different characters on Echo. And in fairness, another reason why I might be underrating Echo, and while I'm leaving some space for like m people to say that call me out and say actually I'm just not experienced enough on Echo, is because I generally play everyone anyway. And the, some of the only characters I can't play effectively are characters that have bad ultimates that you wouldn't want to duplicate with Echo anyway. So in fairness, maybe I only think that duplicate is so easy and so overrated in its difficulty because I think, oh right, you know, I already know how to play this character. You know, I do. Duplicate an Anna, I know how to play Anna already, she's my most played character. I duplicate a Zenyatta, yeah, I played a good amount of Zenyatta, I know how to play that. I duplicate an Ash, yeah, I played a decent amount of Ash, I know how to do this, you know. Especially because I play more tank and support, and tanks and supports are duplicated more often, you get the point, you know. It seems like almost always when I duplicate someone, I don't think, oh shit, what do I do now? Oh, it's difficult to learn how to play this new way, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I already know how to do this. So, yeah.